Um, today's topic is one uh, that is uh, confronting a, a set of China, but a very important set of China's economy, and that is China's multinational corporations. Um, the, as many of you know, um, China has encouraged its companies um, to go out, um, to move into the global economy. Uh, but today's topic looks at how geopolitical tensions are, are dealing uh, or confronting those companies and how they're dealing with those, particularly here in the United States. Um, our speaker today is Professor Ji Li, uh, the long professor of China business and law at the University of California at Irvine. Um, Professor Li is uh, one of the leading figures uh, to examine the behavior of Chinese companies overseas, particularly in the United States and particularly with regards to how they are navigating uh, U.S. courts. Um, he is the author of a book uh, that came out uh, over uh, five years ago uh, called Clash of Capitalisms, uh, which foretold uh, the clash between the different capital systems uh, and the political economies of these countries and the tensions that these would bring about for Chinese companies, particularly in the United States. Um, he's also the author of a book that will be coming out later this spring um, on negotiating legalism and examining specifically um, how Chinese companies are dealing with the uh, legal issues that they're confronting in the United States. Uh, Professor Li received his PhD in political science from Northwestern University. Uh, he received his JD from Yale Law School where he was an Olin Fellow. Um, and of course, um, he's also somebody who's well versed uh, in the business practices of both of these. Uh, two economies, and I'll have him in a minute as I moderate the panel, um, discuss his methodologies and so forth. Um, he's joined today uh, with Professor William Kirby, uh, who I believe needs no introduction, uh, but lest you not know him here, um, he is the uh, Chan Professor of China Studies and the Spangler Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School. Um, he is also the chairman of the Harvard China Fund and the director of the Harvard Center Shanghai, amongst the various titles that he holds. But also, of course, as many of you know, a leading scholar of looking at Chinese companies going overseas as well. So uh, I'm delighted uh, to have both of you uh, here. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Li and Professor Kirby. Thank you all for, for coming. It's uh, really a great pleasure to, to be invited to uh, to talk about uh, this important topic here. Um, so, um, but just very briefly, some, some background. Well, I, I guess we don't have, I, don't, I don't have to um, uh, discuss the importance of the topic right, right now, um, given the geopolitical rivalry between US and China. Um, there's a lot of attention, public attention, on this uh, issue about the expansion of China in the business sector, Chinese multinationals, they're caught uh, increasingly in the crossfire of uh, geopolitical rivalry between U.S. and China. So, um, you know, um, we see that rivalry uh, manifesting uh, increasingly in the legal area, right? Uh, for example, uh, the U.S. imposed all sorts of uh, sanctions on multinational corporations, basically tried to coerce them to cut their connections with China. And at the same time, the Chinese government uh, implements uh, anti-sanctions, right? So. Uh, basically, multinationals are caught in this paradox, in this dilemma. If they comply with U.S. law, then they have to bridge Chinese law, and vice versa. If they comply with Chinese law, then they have to violate U.S. law. So what do, what do they do, right? That's, that's one of the topics I'm exploring. And um, um, so, so um, uh, you know, as Mark mentioned, I've been working on uh, Chinese multinationals in the U.S. Basically, I'm trying to understand how they adapt or fail to adapt to the, to the U.S. institutional context. My previous book was about compliance, more or less, and this forthcoming book is about um, dispute resolution and litigation. And actually, I, I'm, I'm looking at the broader e e ecology for Chinese co uh, multinational corporations in the U.S. So I, I start by looking at their uh, internal legal capacity, right? Uh, if you want to uh, address legal risks in the U.S., you can do two things. One, you rely on U.S. lawyers. The alternative coping strategy is to develop internal legal capacity, as many uh, U.S. corporations do. So um, after that, well, 
those are like two chapters in the book, and then I look at how they resolve disputes in the U.S., how they litigate in U.S. courts. Um, some case studies include Huawei, TikTok, uh, China Telecom, Bank of China, etc. But but um, methodology-wise, I rely on uh, uh, interviews, in-depth interviews with uh, 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 you know professionals, legal professionals, business executives, and also I collect the survey data. I've been collaborating with um, uh, China General Chamber of Commerce, USA. Um, I help them design their uh, annual survey, and uh, I, I insert some questions that interest me um, into the survey questionnaire. And uh, once the data is collected, I, I analyze the data and try to, try to uh, infer something uh, useful from, from the analysis. Uh, so that, that's the book. Uh, um, in terms of theoretical framework, right? Uh, I propose that we, we should understand Chinese multinationals as operating within a dual institutional environment. So they, they are uh, subjected to the institutional influence of the host country, right? They have to comply with U.S. laws because they operate in the U.S. They're subject to U.S. jurisdiction, but at the same time, they are constant, they're constant, uh, constantly under the pressure from the home state uh, institutions, right? Uh, especially for SOEs, right? They are subjected to uh, extensive regulation by SASAC, and uh, also if you look at SOE uh, executives, they, they tend to rotate. Uh, they spend a couple years in the U.S., a couple years in Europe, um, and then back home to the to the uh, to the headquarters. So they they are uh, they they survive, they operate, right, uh, within this, uh, this due institutional context, which shapes their uh, preferences and behavior. So my, this book is about how, they, uh, how, they, how uh, the, this institutional context modify uh, their, their interactions with the U.S. legal system. Um, I, I, as Mark uh, said, I, um, I'm here uh, not really to introduce this book, but more to engage in conversation with experts and, and the audience. So I will stop there. I just you know very brief overview of the book, and I would like to you know start the questions and answers and uh, hear uh, what you will think about it. And uh, yeah, great. Well, thank you. The experts are all in the audience, <laughs> not up here. So I, I hope we will have a vigorous participation from those who are, who are here. You know, the Professor Li's uh, uh, first book on Clash of Capitals is Chinese Companies in the United States, uh, published in 2018. It's really an outstanding book and strongly recommended to all of you. I should have signed it for my undergraduates. This really? Anyway, well, thank you. Uh, but the, but uh, it's a long time almost, it seems, since 2018. I mean, it's not that many years. Right. Five years, but it feels like a different time. Yeah. Uh, in, in so many ways with the decline of U.S.-China relations, uh, uh, the, the onset in 2020 of zero COVID in China, um, uh, and the growing national security state uh, concerns on both sides uh, of the Pacific. And so I've been working uh, over at the business school on a series of cases, now more individual cases, and mostly private companies, not, public, not, not state-owned companies. Uh, and their activities on both sides of the Pacific of how both American and Chinese companies and Hong Kong companies and Taiwan companies try to navigate the geopolitical divide between China and the United States right now. And I think you know, with a, a very simple observation from on high is coming out of COVID and so on, if you're, and I could, I, I, I'm sure I, I can be corrected by two lawyers on either side of me, uh, but from a purely legal perspective, you know, uh, and formally, in terms of formal law, actually China is more open to foreign investment than maybe it's ever been mm -hmm. under the People's Republic. And the United States has become remarkably less open mm -hmm. in this right. And not because it's formally less open, but because, you, you know, right now, if you're looking at regulatory risks, say, as an American multinational or as a Chinese multinational, seeking to do business in both markets, your biggest risk comes from Washington, because you don't know when the next set of regulations uh, or, or, or public hearings are going to 
are going to come down. China has become, you know, bizarrely, but significantly more predictable mm -hmm. uh, in this regard than, than the United States. And so just, just to think about a few of the companies that I've uh, been working on and written about, you know, it is, it is absolutely a low point in the history of diplomacy and of international relations that the two greatest powers of the world are at odds over a teenage video app um, called TikTok. Um, it is a, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that the national security of the United States is now more secure, at least in the state of Montana, which has sought to ban uh, TikTok and allow us to, to uh, allow the Montanans to be free of, uh, uh, although I think they do it anyway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but that's, of course, one area, and uh, TikTok has taken legal steps, and perhaps you could describe some of their legal steps to stay in business uh, in, the, in the United States. Or you would take another remarkable and outstanding company, CATL, the largest and best uh, electric vehicle battery maker in the world, which uh, the, the Ford Motor Company, which has been around a long time by adapting to times, um, uh, wanted to partner with so that Ford could have competitive EVs in this country. And yet that becomes politically mm -hmm. impossible, and politically impossible in order to meet uh, you know, their, 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 uh, their sustainability goals. Uh, are not are are certain to be set back very much, and those of the United States also uh, set back very much. Here, right here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, you know, how many of you take the uh, tea? So, is it a good system? <coughs> no. And where are the cars from? China. They're from Springfield, China. Massachusetts. Exactly right. <laughs> so, Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, and these cars uh, uh, by CRRC uh, uh, in, uh, in China um, <clears throat> are being built in Springfield, Massachusetts for the Boston subway system. Chicago is doing the same. So for the red line, <coughs> excuse me, the red line and the orange line here, um, uh, built by American workers or uh, assembled by American workers in Springfield, which used to be the center of American railway manufacturing, by the last American car made in Springfield was made in 1920. Uh, and this is the biggest industrial investment in Springfield in a half century, overseen and brought to fruition by a Republican governor, Charlie Baker. And yet Senator Schumer says on the Senate floor that we should not have Chinese cars on the red line because there might be spyware on the red line. And people could find out what you're reading, if you're reading, whatever. Um, there's, um, you know, there's almost no end to it. You know, uh, one of the companies that I do is a, is a Hong Kong-based uh, company, a fourth-generation textile company that uh, dates back to the 19-teens in Shanghai. Uh, now the company is called Eskel. They have made half of the high-end men's woven shirts in the world, the largest market being in North America and, and Europe. Uh, a, a kind of a fashion leader, a design leader, also leader in sustainability in the otherwise highly polluting textile industry. Uh, Harvard Business School graduate Margie Young is the, is the chairman uh, of Escal. But they've been caught in the political crossfire because they rely on Xinjiang cotton. And they were accused in a very sloppily written report by a graduate student at the Center for Strategic and International Studies of using forced labor uh, in their Xinjiang spinning mill, a mill that I have actually visited, and it is entirely automated. Uh, so, um, and so they've lost their North American market and 30,000 employees, and the Xinjiang cotton farmers, uh, the private farmers from whom they bought their cotton in recent years, uh, have no, less of a market for their, for their cotton. One could go on and on about, about this. And our friends at Huawei, which you have studied as well, of course. You know, here, here I, 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 it's, a, it's rather a different story. It isn't so much in the sense of what I would call the, this moment of American paranoia, matched often enough by Chinese paranoia. Um, and, but of, you know, here is you know, one of the great technology companies of the world Huawei, which had the opportunity to succeed, at least in my view, in the American market, 
and missed every opportunity to miss an opportunity to become credible uh, with those who would oversee its success. And I remember visiting their, their lobbyists, and I, I visited them in Shenzhen, visited Ren Zhengfei and his team, his international advisory team, and, and so on. This, is, this was a company trying to navigate the United States in this new moment, um, you know, a global technology company, successful in China, but successful in China only because it had been first successful overseas. But this, uh, this company uh, hired eventually a, a, you know, a, you know, a, a battalion of lobbyists. Um, by the time I met with them, they were down to three lobbyists in offices larger than our floor upstairs, um, much larger actually, just but three lonely people. Uh, and they had a lot to say to somebody who had come and visit them, so I was very fortunate. But there is a company in which a great global international company, which was undone, in my view, in the United States, in part by the U.S. government, to be sure, but they missed many opportunities to become credible with those who would criticize it. And it's in part because every decision was made by a team advising Mr. Ren back home in Shenzhen, a team in charge of their international corporate relations, uh, headed by uh, a leader who spoke not a word of any foreign language. Uh, so you have a great international company, but with a business culture of a regional family business. And really, why hung in, in, this, in this realm? Uh, and it uh, doesn't mean they couldn't sue the United States, because they did. They did, yeah. They did, and so you have several of these suits. And, and, so, and, and those decisions were also made back in, in the headquarters. Is by, that right? By lay people. Gender. Yeah, that's why I, they, they were not very <laughs> successful in the U.S. Wow. Wars. That, uh, that I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, that's in this book. <laughs> so, you know, but, you know, a, a kind of a question, you know, there are happily a, a few counterexamples, and this is what's so depressing at the moment. I'm kind of, you know, lots of American companies are still doing very well in China, despite what you will read. They're, they wouldn't be in China if they were not making money. So uh, uh, that's what businesses do, um, so even if they are de-risking uh, and doing more things for China and for the world separately. Um, but there are a few happy counter stories. But I think my absolute first HBS case was done back in 2007 on Wanqiang mm. uh, in, the, in China, this Hangzhou-based auto parts company mm. founded in 1969 at the height of the Cultural Revolution. Um, or at least that's the date that they claim to be the founding date. As a, Socialist enterprise, a should do a chia in a in a rim and gong shi, but it becomes over time, like so many companies, basically a, a, a TVE township village enterprise, then truly what it's always been a family business and now a global business, and they invested in the auto parts industry in the upper Midwest in the early two thousands at a time in which no one on earth saw the future of that industry. And it was a very risky bet. Mm -hmm. If Obama had not bailed out uh, the American automobile companies, they would right. probably, it would not have been as successful. But it turns out to be an outstanding bet, and they saved tens of thousands of American jobs uh, in the process of doing it. And one of the remarkable moments in U.S.-China relations, and one should grasp those good moments. I mean, it's a sad moment and, it's, and a good moment. When uh, the founder of this firm, Lu Guanzhou, passed away, three years ago, I think, uh, in Hangzhou. There was a memorial service for him in Hangzhou, one also in, in China, in, in Beijing, China, and in Chicago, overseen by the governor of Illinois and the mayor of Chicago, because this company had become a great corporate citizen in the Chicago re uh, region, very good corporate se sense of corporate social responsibility. It's an American company, Wanchang America, incorporated. Right. But of course, it's a Chinese company run by the son-in-law, a family business uh, of, the, of the founder. But those, those opportunities seem so few. And, and at this moment, this is the last uh, thing I'll say for, for right now. Uh, we just had a <coughs> next door uh, uh, um, Ambassador Leitzinger, from, uh, the, who had been the chief negotiator with the, with, uh, for the United States on trade deals with China during the uh, Trump administration and with uh, the Reagan administration on Japan. Uh, and 
um, a, a tough negotiator on both sides trying to break uh, bring down the trade deficit that the United States had. But, and of course the situations are different, which he pointed out, but in the 1980s that trade tension was diffused to a considerable degree by Japanese investment in the United States, particularly in the automobile industry, which was a hot point. Uh, Right now, do you think that another one of my business school cases, in, uh, EV company NEO, is going to be able to start production in the United States or to sell, even to sell uh, in the United States? Because they're selling well in Norway, they're, selling, they're starting to sell in Germany and the Netherlands and elsewhere. Chinese EVs are, doing, are starting to do well in European markets. Would we, you know, keep out a private Chinese EV company from producing automobiles that are both better and cheaper than any are, that are likely to be produced in the United States for American consumers. I don't know, but I'm, a, I'm not optimistic no, no. that we have the wisdom to do that, mm -hmm. even if it would bring a lot of jobs right. to the... So, uh, so, Professor Lee, how are you going to solve this? <laughs> right. Uh, let, me, oh. let me broaden the sure. scope out yeah. a little bit more so we're not talking just solely about Neil here, right? No, I think no, there, no, there are a couple of things that came out in this last exchange, right? One of the questions is, um, is there a difference in terms of how private companies are responding versus state companies? Mm -hmm. Amongst private companies, could we disaggregate <laughs> them even further mm -hmm. by certain mm -hmm. types? Among state-owned companies, um, is it different if it's overseen by central SESAC versus one of the provincial SESACs versus if it's just simply a TBE uh, remnant legacy firm and so forth. So that's one set of questions. Mm -hmm. The other is, um, let's talk a little bit more about tactics, right? Two tactics came about. One is in terms of um, lobbying directly, whether that's uh, federal government, central uh, state, local government, and so forth. The other is corporate social responsibility, those types of measures. Are you seeing other types of strategies that are being used? So just wanted to ask you to take uh, this and sort of expand a little bit more for our audience and unpack a little bit. Because I think oftentimes people think, right, Chinese multinationals, it's one type, but really your research is showing um, just as American multinationals can't all be lumped together, same is true for Chinese multinationals. Right. Uh, yeah, th those are very good questions. So, um, so first, um, uh, you know, as uh, uh, my previous book and this one um, um, have shown, there's enormous uh, inter uh, intercompany variations. Right. A big uh, distinguishing uh, factor is uh, ownership type. State-owned enterprises and privately owned enterprises, they have different, log they operate with different uh, logic, right? Uh, SOEs, profit maximization is not their top concern, and not even a prioritized uh, objective for SOE executives when they make decisions, or any type of decisions. So um, um, you have all sorts of, uh, well, the, the, you, uh, SASAC is the nominal right, uh, shareholder, but also a regulator. But it um, uh, depends on the sector of the SOE. They may also have to respond to other uh, government agencies in China. And as I mentioned, uh, the senior executives of SOEs, they uh, almost always are expatriates from China and they rotate. They stay in the US only for a couple years, um, at most seven years, um, for various reasons. Um, and uh, given the context, actually political context, many of them uh, are scared, right? Uh, they, um, they, they want to go back to China. They are afraid that what happened to Meng Wanzhou will happen to them. Um, but uh, it's hard to find their replacements, uh, their, the headquarters. It used to be the case where uh, people compete, you know, competed, would compete to, to be assigned to the U.S., right? But these days, they just try to avoid uh, being assigned to the U.S. Some of my uh, interview subjects, all right, uh, stay over their, their, uh, their uh, supposed uh, tenure in the U.S. because nobody would come and replace them. So they're stuck here. Uh, they, they're really scared. Um, um, so SOEs and POEs, privately owned enterprises, are entirely different. The POEs, mostly they, they maximize their, their, their goal is to maximize their profits. Of course, how they do that is 
very much determined by the institutional context they're in, or so by their you know their limited uh, rationality, right? They 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 have very little knowledge about the U.S. Um, institutional context, uh, as Bill mentioned, right? They very very much uh, if they have little exposure to the U.S. context, right? They make decisions based on their mindset, their their uh, values, their perceptions formed within the Chinese context. So they missed a lot of opportunities. They assume a lot of risks that shouldn't have been assumed. They make a, mistake, um, a lot of mistakes. So um, as we use POEs are uh, very different and they, they, uh, their preferences and their behavior is totally different. And uh, among SOEs, um, I actually, uh, this book uh, doesn't distinguish uh, central SOEs and provincial municipal SOEs. But that's a fascinating question. That's, as I gestured in the end of the book, that's an important topic to be explored in the future. Um, um, but um, based on my interviews, my, um, the, the idea is that central SOEs, um, the, the staff, the managers, they tend to be better educated. Uh, they tend to uh, be more professional. Uh, but when it comes to professional as uh, a provincial SOEs or municipal SOEs, um, uh, the the managers they may not be be as educated as uh, or their credentials may not be as good as um, uh, executives at central SOEs. Yeah, but that's a fascinating question that should be explored in, in future research. And the second uh, set of questions, tactics, and this, um, how do Chinese multinationals cope with this uh, impossible dilemma, right? The, the geopolitical rivalry. Lobbying is a very important uh, coping strategy, and different uh, Chinese corporations spend different amount of money on lobbying. And based on my previous research uh, in the uh, it seems that uh, SOEs actually spend more money on uh, lobbying. And uh, I talked to my informants and said, why, why is that the case? And SOEs said, uh, well, the, 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 my informant said, well, SOEs, do, they have soft budget uh, limit, right? So they can afford spending money on something that doesn't generate immediate return. Um, but for privately owned SOEs, uh, when they spend money on lobbying, they want immediate result. Uh, Huawei is a good example, right? Uh, they send people to lobby the government, and it has to show up in their KPI, right? Whether they can invite uh, U.S. policymakers to China to meet with uh, Ren Zhengfei or his uh, his advisors, that will show up. Right? They want immediate, immediate, tangible result. But uh, SOEs, they don't need that. Even, but still, um, my informant uh, left uh, DC uh, just two years ago, right? Why? And before he, his departure, he said, well, there's just no future in the US, right? The SOEs is now in, the, in this mode of, uh, well, they basically stopped expanding in the US. They don't anticipate any cross-border MA deal that involve uh, US assets. So there's no need to engage in lobbying anymore. So there's, you, you see both sides to this story, right? On the one hand, SOEs engage in lobbying because they don't need the immediate result. On the other hand, given the political context, the, the rivalry, they don't see any future, so they don't see any possible need for future lobbying. So um, that's, that's lobbying, and, but private POE still spend, I think they spend an increasing amount of money on lobbying, TikTok, uh, invest millions of dollars in lobbying. So that's one tactic. I actually categorize, I create this typology of coping strategies of Chinese multinationals uh, in response to the ge geopolitical rivalry. One is organizational coping strategies. So they basically exit the US market or downsize the US market. That's the response to the increasing political risk in the US. Right? That's actually, you see that 
happen more frequently than, than their legal coping strategies of lobbying. And that's, so that's one uh, category. And the second is compliance strategies. They try to, they, find, they hire lawyers, good lawyers, <coughs> try to find loopholes in U.S. regulations. So they will stay in compliance with U.S. law while still try to generate some profit, continue to do business in the U.S. And the third category is reform strategy, which includes lobbying. Right? They try to change the law or prevent some law from being implemented or uh, convince regulatory agencies that uh, they are exempt from certain uh, rules. Um, another important uh, reform strategy will be litigation. They try to change the law by filing lawsuits, litigating in U.S. courts. So that's what TikTok has been doing, that's what um, uh, Huawei has been doing. To varying degree of success, right? Huawei hasn't been really successful because, as I mentioned, the litigation decisions were made in China by their general counsel. Their global general counsel is an IP lawyer trained in China, had no US legal education. And he wasn't a lawyer in the first, he was an engineer who self studied. Chinese law then passed the bar, right? You didn't have to go to law school back, you know, decades ago. You didn't have to go to law school to pass the bar exam. So that, he was the general legal uh, global general counsel for Huawei, and he was making the litigation decisions in the U for for the U.S. operations. So no surprise, right? Uh, the, the the strategy has have, have not been very successful. But TikTok, right? They they are based they. They have been adapted. They have been quite adaptive, right? They have been Amer fully Americanized, right? They operate basically as a, a U.S. corporations, right? So, so decisions are made locally. They are very uh, aggressive in terms of litigating uh, against the U.S. Uh, 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 rules and, and regulations. So they have been relatively successful, and so uh, it varies also across different different uh, forums. So um, CSR, um, I, I'm glad Bill mentioned uh, the Wanxiang uh, example because um, Li Ping is, uh, Li right. Ping is, uh, is uh, the uh, chairman of, of Wanxiang USA. He, is just, he, he got his PhD in the US. He had been in the US for a very long time, very smart person. He understands the importance to be immersed in the US, be, be a, a member of the local uh, 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 social uh, ecol uh, system, right? They contribute to, to local uh, or donate to charitable organizations, engage in frequent interactions, both formal and informal, with local uh, stakeholders. So, you know, um, but even Wan Xiang today feels a lot of pressure right, mm -hmm. from the geopolitical rivalry. So, uh, but you, you see that, you know, the Wan Xiang is one. And at one end of this continuum in terms of adapting to the U.S. system, and Huawei probably the other end of the continuum. Yeah. Right. Well, so just some, some thoughts on that. I was thinking of Wan Xiang. They were under political pressure when they acquired uh, the battery maker here, A123, mm -hmm. which is headquartered in Waltham, uh, Massachusetts. And um, it had been a failed um, uh, company uh, that had been bailed out by the Obama administration, mm -hmm. but then it was not successful, and so it, uh, and they went through a lengthy process with Sifius, mm -hmm. and succeeded, right, in time, um, and and you know took every, it took seemingly forever, but uh, very very successful, and they seem to have turned a one two three around as a, as as a firm, but, the, but their original reason for doing that, and. Here we would have to ask Ni Pin, if this is 100% true, but the chairman, uh, Lu Guancho, basically his vision was to also become a leader in electric vehicles mm -hmm. once upon a time. And they are building an electric vehicle in California, mm -hmm. a really cool sports car, mm -hmm. about $140,000, not, but not very many of them. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's a, a kind of show project. Rather than, but they were successful with the... Uh, with uh, CFIUS in a way that uh, others find it, you know, way too daunting. One question: What about that was just occurring to me, thinking of the case of Neo, but also some others? What about the private company 
that gets an infusion from a local government. Like NEO is you know, 25% uh, owned by Hefe government, right. Hefe right. municipal government. Are they a state-owned enterprise? From, uh, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, so uh, how do you define a, a state-owned enterprise, right? Uh, there was uh, some debate earlier, uh, Donna Clark, uh, a law professor, at George Washington University, and he wrote a paper uh, claiming that Huawei could be uh, defined as an SOE, right? Because uh, it was uh, employee owned, but owned through this uh, structure, yeah. through this, uh, this uh, state body. Um, it was just really the nominal, right, uh, uh, ownership structure, but uh, uh, it could you know, stretch the definition as an SOE, then Huawei could be defined as SOE. So, um, and, and also there's this paper published by uh, uh, Curtis Milhaupt, right, about uh, uh, the, how do you distinguish SOE? And, uh, and the POE is one SOE is also highly in, uh, immersed in the uh, interventionist state, right? Uh, it's a lot of uh, private, uh, POEs also receive a lot of uh, capital investment from uh, uh, government entities, probably not directly, but indirectly through their investment vehicles, right? And uh, so, um, so it's hard uh, these days to define, to, to draw the boundary. And so it depends on the, the subject area, right? If they are trying to go through CFIS review, I think NEO will probably will be subject to very strict scrutiny because of Huawei municipal government's investment, yeah. right? Um, and Huawei, I'm sure the government has a, a, a strong voice in the, in the decision, business decision, decisions of NEO. And that will raise a lot of attention uh, during the CPS review process. So I, I, I'm not sure. So you also Hopefully must. It's a nice city, though. We yeah, nice. yeah. Well, anyway, uh, and uh, I don't think the investment was really politically driven. No, right? totally it's not. Really it was, to, a, it was to an very smart, to keep them going. Yeah, yeah. smart uh, investment, right? <laughs> yep. Makes yep. a lot of sense in retrospect. Yep. But uh, that's probably not the view of uh, the CPS agents, uh, right? Um, and you mentioned the uh, CATL, right, mm. uh, the Ford. Mm, yeah. they, they initially wanted to do a joint venture, but because of political pressure, uh, they decided to do a licensing deal. But right. even that is now <laughs> probably not going to happen, right? So the, the uh, uh, business actors, they try to adapt, right? They, instead of, well, they want to take into <laughs> consideration political risks. So they, instead of, uh, you know, vertical integration, right, uh, doing a joint venture or just uh, doing a M&A transaction, right, acquiring a U.S. company, they're now trying to distance uh, but still collaborate, right? Li if licensing works, they will do, they will engage in a licensing uh, project. If that doesn't work, I think, uh, well, I, I don't know. The, the, the next step will probably be just um, uh, forming some kind of uh, collaboration in a third country uh, to be distanced from the U.S. jurisdiction as much as possible, maybe engaging in some uh, joint research or collaboration in, uh, I don't know, Singapore um, or Switzerland. So that's, that's possible, right? So, but um, um, the takeaway is that um, uh, I, increasingly, uh, I think, uh, Chinese multinational corporations uh, have uh, factored uh, the political risk into their business decisions, include, well, uh, including also uh, POEs. I don't think they, uh, without, especially this year, election year, right, there's so many, so many uncertainties, right, the heightened uh, political risk. So I think they, they will probably uh, uh, suspend any expansion plans for the moment and take a wait and see approach. So, um, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna interrupt here. I wanna make sure we have leave sufficient sure. time for sure. our audience members. <clears throat> um, but if not, we can pick up the conversation, but I suspect we could fill full two hours here with the back and forth. Uh, so uh, if you have a question, I just wanna invite you to raise your hand. Uh, we'll bring a microphone around, so please wait until the microphone. And then please, um, please also uh, state your name and your affiliation and try to keep your question as short as possible. Uh, so maybe we could start with uh, Professor Xiao. Um, 
My name is Bill Shell. I'm a retired uh, professor of economics at Harvard, but I don't specialize in your topic. So I have two related questions. In your coping strategy, do you find actually some Chinese multinationals trying to actually use a long-term strategy, like Taiwan, chip company, where are they setting up their factory? Arizona, that's a swing state. So you actually set up a long-term political base in a swing state that the representatives and senators and local officials can actually influence American politics in a much closer way. Then if you look at the Japanese firms, what do they do? Which investment banks do they engage to offer their IPOs? And where do they deposit the money? So does the Chinese multinationals actually going beyond the immediate coping, like lobbying, but dealing with really longer range of really building up the political base, you see Hong Kong businessmen, Japanese businessmen, Taiwan businessmen actually do. That's my, but then a related question is this. Then, as you point out, a multinational has to deal with the law of two countries, the United States and China. How do these companies are coping with the uncertainty of how Chinese law may change, as well as how the laws will be enforced and interpreted? That creates a tremendous amount of uncertainty for cooperation. Can you comment on that? Sure, great. Uh, those are very good questions. I'll start with the first one. Um, so based on empirical uh, study, uh, you, you don't see a collective, uh, r a collective rationality uh, in terms of uh, you know, uh, Chinese multinationals investing in sw um, swing states, try to uh, 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 modify or, or shape US foreign policies. You see that happening, you're great. Uh, you're uh, exactly uh, uh, right on, you know, the Japanese, if you look at how they engage in FDI in the U.S., you see they invest in, in states uh, that, that in order to affect the U.S. policy toward Japan. So I think that's very smart, very strategic, but um, based on empirical uh, study uh, done a couple years ago, uh, Chinese uh, investors uh, are not engaging in the collective efforts. They are not in, uh, uh, adopting this long-term strategy, so, and, and I think now it's too late. If they do that, uh, they will be uh, blamed for trying to uh, uh, sway U.S. Uh, policy, right? Try, try to intervene in U.S. Uh, domestic politics. Um, so I, I think they have missed their uh, open window for that. Um, so um, and uh, um, but that doesn't mean that. Uh, uh, politics had nothing to do with you, uh, Chinese FDI in the U.S. So I, uh, during my interviews, um, uh, you know, Chinese investors invest in states. Uh, they choose the states. They choose the states that are relatively, comparatively friendly towards China, right? So, so they, now they avoid Texas, uh, absolutely. Uh, um, um, they're not probably going to Florida either. Um, but so, so they definitely take into consideration the politics of state politics when they make investment decisions. Um, um, so the second question, um, um, how do they cope with uncertainties uh, about uh, uh, the making and enforcement of laws in both China and the US, right? Um, so yeah, so that's, def that's a very good question. That's part of this uh, geopolitical referee. Uh, we, ha we see an increasing number of uh, laws being uh, enacted and being implemented uh, that at try attempt to address the national security concern. But 
we all know that national security is a vague, abstract concept, right? It's hard to draw a boundary uh, that I will circle national security. So there's just increase the risk that uh, will be factored into business uh, transactional decisions. So, uh, but that's just part of doing business, right? Uh, on global scale, there are always uncertainties and risk. So the, the consequence is simply that the risk adjusted return has decreased for Chinese multinational corporations. So they probably will not engage in certain transactions because now they will expect a negative return. Um, and uh, so this is uh, the global environment for all multinational corporations. So they have to, they, they have no, uh, as I mentioned, while well, they engage in some reform strategies, right? Uh, they, they try to lobby, they try to litigate in the US, and they also engage in some, as much as they can, um, uh, uh, organizational strategies, they, they withdraw from certain markets, they um, you know, spin off some operations in the US or in China, depends on the headquarters of the, of the multinational. So they, they try, to adopt, uh, try to adapt as much as they can, but certain uncertainties are just inherent, right? Um, especially in the current uh, uh, geopolitical context. And it just reduced their risk-adjusted return. And that, I think that's a, a systematic risk uh, that, that's affecting all multinational corporations. So uh, yeah, that's just a new fact. Thank you for, for those two very good questions. No, no, I'm done. Well, uh, Professor Jim, thanks for the talk, and thanks to Phil for the comments. Uh, so uh, my name is Mei I'm from Boston University. Uh, so uh, I've been working on this. I just asked uh, two uh, quick questions. One, uh, I feel the, um, the current framing, still thinking about private state, uh, as, uh, as type, so Chinese company is less useful uh, uh, than before because now the whole uh, the, 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 the intensification of, of tension is already like anything related to China, then it will be um, uh, present the same kind of problem. So I, I wonder on this, um, accepting that Chinese firms uh, is already tarnished, right? Uh, but there are different sectors. W are you saying the, um, the, the, the companies or uh, people who work in these areas begin to really identify, sharpen down, what are the sectors uh, that in China that actually are more promising and can find uh, correlations or willing? Uh, in the in the United States? Um, uh, uh, because I think that I have a lot of literature on this, so, so I, first the question is, do you see the, 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 the firm's coping strategy or response moving away from traditional compliance uh, uh, to, to thinking about this uh, 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 sectorial uh, uh, complementality and from a more traditional globalization perspective, are there places and sector that actually are more promising for, for, for the Chinese firm. The second is, I think this theory is a critical issue for China, right? But I wonder, particularly to Bill, you've seen this for so long, is this critical moment for America? Yeah, I see like anything that the China, the EV, the question, for example, last year EV uh, uh, exports from China part of the world, BYD surpassed, uh, Tesla, immediately two foreign affairs articles coming out talking about this is, is greatest challenge to America. I, uh, and, and so so the, the, the relative competitiveness of China in a renewable energy and the green industry are just so immense. And America, no matter how much tariff you increase, it's still in, uncompetitive. So the only way that to come out is really to limit trade and limit investments. Uh, in short term, maybe it undercuts China, but in the long term, I, I actually don't know. So the, the, is, is, is this a kind of critical moment for American uh, uh, economic power as well? Thank you. 
Yeah, those are very good questions. And um, so first, um, 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 yeah, so, so uh, there has been this, uh, since um, uh, Milhoff's uh, article came out, there's been debate that SOEs and uh, POEs, they don't really differ that much. That's actually a question, empirical question for me to explore in the book. So the, uh, you know, I, I did, um, I, uh, based on my analysis, it appears that at least for the topic I am addressing, right, their adaptation to the legal system, it, it seems to, that uh, the ownership tab uh, really matters. Um, but uh, uh, from the U.S. Pol policymakers perspective, right, they see all Chinese investors as Chinese investors, right, uh, period. You know, well, if they are SOEs, of course, they, during the CFIUS review process, there may be more scrutiny, uh, but it, uh, POEs can also have state-related investors as well, right? Um, so uh, to, to U.S. policymakers, you know, this may be a subtle difference that they don't really care. Um, and um, so sectors, yes, I, I, for some of the topics I explored, it does seem to matter, um, especially uh, when it comes to, uh, well, there's one chapter about uh, how they interact with U.S. lawyers. Uh, what do they care? When they do, what do they consider when they pick a select U.S. lawyers, right? Do they want to select the U.S. lawyers with U.S. government background? Right, so uh, do they select the U.S. lawyers that uh, are uh, the least expensive, right? Except, you know, there's a long list of considerations. And it, it seems that those operating in sensitive factors, in a sector, in sectors that are heavily regulated, they don't really care much about the legal fee. They, they will pick the best lawyers they can find. Um, but uh, for SOEs, uh, this relates to the ownership tab. SOEs want to pick U.S. lawyers with government background. And the reason that is they want to mitigate the, the trust, the deficiency, right? They want to pick the lawyers who are insiders, who have the trust of the U.S. government to work for the SOEs. Um, so um, uh, that's just, you know, one probably uh, more concrete answer to your broad question, right? Uh, does sector matter? Um, I think it matters, and depend, but to what extent it matters depends on the topic, the question you want to answer. Um, so, and, and you raise a good, very good point, right? In some sectors, China is highly competitive. Chinese companies are highly competitive, and uh, so, so the renewable energy sector, it's hard for the U.S. government to really cut off China, right? So, but to how do you, what kind of form do, will collaboration take place, right? So uh, joint venture is all out of the picture, right? And so licensing is getting very hard as well, but I think it will still happen in the form of licensing or maybe a joint uh, collaboration in third countries. And then through the third country, you pass the technology to the U.S. So that's, I think, will be the coping strategy uh, that probably we'll, we'll see that happen in the future, in the near future, yeah. Um, but uh, I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, okay, yeah, afterwards. Thank you. Thank so just one thought on this. We're a good set of questions, of course. You know, when you look about it, if, uh, if this divide, particularly in the automobile industry, continues, you know, it doesn't look like it can possibly be good news for the American automobile industry. General Motors does not exist as a company today if it were not for the, its China market. And restrictions on one side will in inevitably in international trade and diplomatic relations result in restrictions, formal or informal, on the other side. And we'll see how well they can be competitive with the new EV market um, uh, in, in China. And so really the only way one can imagine a quick cooperation, a, 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 a way of, you know, this ought to be a mutually advantageous relationship in this, in this market, and, and yet for political reasons it is not. So the likelihood is the third country operation, and you know, say CATL, and I'm just making this up, with Volkswagen will be, bring, build more plants in Mexico, mm -hmm. and they'll come in through NAFTA, mm -hmm. or whatever it's called now, yeah. uh, and the, um, 
And uh, that will actually help Mexico, which helps indirectly the American economy, but it actually doesn't do what it might have done uh, uh, here. Or another area of historical cooperation, kind of the, had been the least political of our areas of cooperation, is agriculture. Then huge American exports to China. Uh, then this becomes highly politicized with the Trump tariffs, which end up costing American taxpayers extraordinary amounts of money to bail out the American farmers for what they've lost in the, in the China market. And now we have this, ins I can only call it, insane paranoia about Chinese agribusinesses that are, um, you know, have, have looked to experiment and learn from American agribusiness about how to modernize Chinese agriculture. Uh, that they're, the Chinese are buying up our farmland. And so far, I think 0.1% uh, of farmland is owned by any company that is directly related to China, and so this is, without question, the most extraordinary national security threat I've ever seen. So we'll take a question there, and then if you could move a mic over there. Is there anyone else who has a question? Okay, so uh, when you're done with your question, if you could pass it to the gentleman behind you in the meantime. Okay, Hi, please. Thank you. My name is Rosie. I'm a um, Mason Fellow and an MBA student. Um, Ten years ago, I'm not a, a practitioner anymore. I was a former <coughs> FBI lawyer and uh, CSR and the government affairs, um, working in multinationals, both in the US. Uh, I also work with the Latin group. I was in Myanmar. Um, um, yes, yeah, through my practice, I have seen a lot of uh, the real time case, as Professor mentioned and Bill mentioned. Um, I just want to bring two of my questions for discussion, if possible. One is, um, it's always been the case that people have been arguing why Chinese companies, when they are going abroad, they are not being um, seen as global companies, still seen as a Chinese company. Um, even they hire uh, the top talents uh, studying abroad, but the behavior or the, the, um, the appetite is still um, being um, regarded as a Chinese company and with less global uh, flavor. Um, although they're trying to work on with PRs, with um, CSRs, with strategists, but still seems not uh, making significant progress. Maybe Professor Lee has more to come upon it in terms of uh, what could be done differently in the past. Um, I noticed that Chinese uh, as, um, state owned company have done have made some change uh, regarding their CSR um, strategies. Instead of just uh, giving the money or giving aid directly, uh, they start to do some soft CSR, like they are building vocational schools in Africa where they are doing belt and road um, projects and building railways. It has been very successful, as, as far as I know, in Africa. I'm wondering if some a um, similar um, approach um, can be discussed um, in this arena uh, where we are doing business in the U.S. Um, on the other side, um, from the United States' point of view, um, I really want to um, ask Professor Bill um, and all of you a question is that, because we always want to know what is the root cause, right? Why the media, why the congressmen, when they are participating the hearing, they ask questions to I remember the TikTok CEO was the question. One of the uh, congressmen, I don't even understand why find this you know, fundamental question very clearly. So it seems like there's a lot of uh, mistrust. Um, you know, it was embedded deeply um, in these um, uh, people uh, with powers, uh, at least from the previous um, generations. What can we do to prepare the future American business leader or political or uh, legislator to understand more about China? Because uh, China has been doing a lot of culture exchange, bring medical students, law students from various countries in Southeast Asia and Africa to prepare them to have global mindset and uh, have a, a certain appreciation about China and how they run the country and business. I'm wondering if people to people connections can be at some point um, been re-established um, like those days in Nixon and Clinton's where a lot of American students was coming to China, study Chinese languages. So, uh, right, good, good questions. So, um, uh, so why Chinese companies are viewed as Chinese companies when they invest abroad? Um, that, that's over uh, simply over generalization, I think. Um, they, 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 some, uh, it, based on my research, um, a lot of Chinese companies try to hide their Chinese 
uh, identity, especially uh, POEs. Uh, they, they try to present themselves as local U.S. company. They will change their name, they, they will hire you know, a local salesperson. They, they don't, they're, they're, they, you can't tell from their business, or their website, that uh, they're, they're actually a Chinese company. And for larger Chinese companies, um, uh, there's, you know, they vary again, they vary in terms of their degree of interna internationalization. So you, you, look, you can compare Huawei with Lenovo. Lenovo, um, they claim, uh, they call themselves a, Chinese, uh, a global company with Chinese heritage. Right, and so uh, they, they have a, a global headquarters in, in North Car uh, uh, Carolina, right? And uh, their global general counsel is a U.S. lawyer, uh, a, a seasoned U.S. lawyer. So their their board, you see, many of member, many of their board members are non-Chinese uh, executives. So um, so I, I think you know. Uh, but Huawei, right, and the China Telecom, they remain Chinese. Companies, uh, you see a lot of Chinese attributes, but um, but other for the other companies, they they have been fully globalized, and China is just part of their operations. So I think it varies. I, I wouldn't say Chi you know all Chinese companies will remain uh, 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 Chinese even if they have uh, op been operating abroad for a long time. Um, and the second, uh, well, uh, is uh, U.S. politicians seem to be ignorant about China, right? I, I think, uh, you know, the, I, I'm quoting uh, this comment from a, a, a lobbyist who used to, work for, for, used to work for a Chinese SOE. Uh, he, he worked in D.C. for a long time, and he said, you can't wake up a person who is faking sleep, right? Uh, the politicians, they know China, uh, or at least they know a lot, as to, they know something, uh, you know, the basic, basic uh, they have the basic understanding of China, but they pretend they don't, right, because it serves their political interest. A lot of what you see in D.C. is just political drama, right? Uh, they, they, the politicians, they need, to, uh, answer, they need to react to their constituencies, and their constituencies will better, uh, benefit from uh, increasing confrontation with China. Right, uh, labor union, right, uh, some rights groups. In F Florida, you know, a lot of Cuban voters really hate China. Uh, in Orange County, Vietnamese voters really hate China. We really hate Communist Party. So the politicians who got elected in Orange County in Florida, of course, they will, they will, they will uh, you know, do anything within their power to increase U.S.-China rivalry. So you have to disaggregate the U.S. politics, look at different uh, politicians, look at their constituencies. Some of them really benefit from a U.S.-China rivalry. And that momentum, which created, was created during the Trump administration, continues because of that, because of that, uh, you know, the diversity of interest. So keep that in mind. They, they, they are smart people, right? They're smart politicians. They, they're ignorant about China because that serves their political interest, not because they're, they're dumb. Let me just add one comment on the matter question, which is on people to people. I think I was very encouraged during the last year of several trips to China, meeting with uh, heads of Chinese universities in all parts of greater China um, about the need to restart our academic partnerships and relationships uh, with, met with enthusiastic uh, approval and cooperation. Uh, we were able to send several hundred undergraduates to China last summer. Uh, we are starting a summer school in Shanghai next summer. We had a very successful language program in Taipei. Uh, we've given a lot of faculty grants for renewed uh, intellectual cooperation with China. Um, our Fairbank Center has you know, done an extraordinary job in bringing Chinese scholars over here for both public and confidential conversations. So I think you know, the good thing about universities is that they outlive governments. So stick around. <laughs> right, that's probably the best uh, strategy, right? long-term strategy. Hi, Eva from Asia Center. Uh, the, I was, you know, a company user when they are, you know, facing the crisis. The PR is very <coughs> important, and spokesman also very important. So about the Xinjiang cotton, 
uh, Professor mm. Kirby just mentioned, but we never really hear anything about like a defense on this issue. So I'm wondering, I think whether the China should always consider a, even a better a PR, you know, besides all all these like a foreign uh, affairs the department, you know, make an issue. Okay, and then secondly, I think the the like a, a senator in Arkansas, it's kind of a the case you just mentioned. Uh, it's kind of you know because it's owned by the they they say it's owned by the, the Chinese. Uh, uh, a state-owned company, and uh, it 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 would it was a fine, some penalty, and also forced maybe to sell. And what will be your prediction about this happening in uh, in United States? And so, what I mean, if um, if a people like a Professor Kirby, you will be the spokesman for China, uh, China, were you also facing some uh, FBI investigation? All right, and we have one other question. If you could just ask your question uh, very quickly. I think we only have time for one more. So, uh, yeah. yeah I'll turn to our Chinese school. So, I have a question. Uh, it's, it's very interesting to hear that you find lots of SOEs in uh, the US, they are sending people back to China. And because you mentioned they see no future here. But so, my question is like, um, do they face any political pressures from domestic China to calling them or push them back to China? Um, as they are like countries. Thank you. All right, with apologies, I saw there's a couple of other hands still up, so with apologies for that, if uh, we could turn to those two questions. The, the first question, I, I, I really did. I, I, let, me, let me take a stab at that, because yeah. I, I, I've never been asked to be a spokesperson for China, and I'm not sure <laughs> that I would be a, a very good spokesperson for China, but it actually gets to one of our other questions. You know, as a historian, having looked through archives of different political decision points in the, both the history of U.S.-China relations and in personal encounters with both American and Chinese leaders at different levels, it is oh, just appalling what people know or don't know, okay? And, and the levels of ignorance, prejudice, and so on. Um, um, I mean, I, I could tell you stories, but I will not tell you stories. Uh, 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 that, that relate to this, but if we think, it is true that a number of our leaders are significantly better informed than they show. Mm -hmm. no, no, no question about that. Um, and I must say, years, years and years ago, I was uh, part of an Aspen Institute thing for members of Congress on China when uh, uh, then Senator Biden was head of the Foreign Relations Committee, and I was amazed at how expert he was on issues of politics and even history in East Asia. Mm -hmm. He was really, really deeply knowledgeable. Um, but it's rare. Um, it's, it's very rare. They don't come, you know, what, what should we do to help them? They should come back for uh, remedial education at the Kennedy School, mm -hmm. I guess, uh, or uh, at one of, our, one of our places. But that's, that's the one thing that I would say to that. I mean, you should have the final word, sir. No, I, 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 actually, I didn't quite get the, the second question. So for those central SOEs managers um, like here in, in the States, so they, they go back. So do they, have, do they have any political pressure in China to call them to go back? Or <coughs> just like purely because they see, OK, here the environment is not good. They see no future for the market. Yeah, so good, good point. Uh, um, I asked them the question, right? Uh, so if you don't see any future here, why do some of them were sent back, but uh, some stayed. They said, you know, um, just take a, a wait and see approach, right? You, you, as we use, they're like, they're more like, you know, bureaucratic body of the extended bureaucratic body. Uh, as we managers are risk averse and uh, uh, so, so definitely, they're not going to expand in the U.S. right any, any further within the, the, the uh, within the political context. But they also, you know, if they exit the U.S., it's a big deal, right? They have uh, been in the U.S. for decades. For some of them, they've been here for decades. They have uh, their staff here, uh, offices or some uh, operations here. Uh, so they just take a you know a typical risk-averse approach. Let's wait and see. And so those who are already here, they're stuck <laughs> because nobody wants to be assigned to the U.S. to replace them, uh, but they cannot return either. So yeah, they're just they're downsizing and uh, trying to preserve status quo as much as possible. 
thank you both for a fascinating discussion. Please join us next week at the same time for Professor Meg Rithmeyer speaking about can the Chinese financial system be effective. And again, thank you both, uh, Professor Kirby, Professor Lee. Please join me in a round of applause. Well, thank you all. Thank you.